Coming up on DTNS, GM takes on Tesla with new electric vehicle battery tech. Twitter joins the ephemeral messaging trend. Is it still a trend at this point? Also, what makes a good coder? Spoiler, they map. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, March 4th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. We were just talking about not touching your face and the heroic diary of Elizabeth Lopato at The Verge. Uh, that was all on Good Day Internet. If you want to get that conversation and more, you got to become a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Hulu's live TV service is now available on Sony's PlayStation, joining YouTube TV as options to replace the now closed PlayStation View streaming TV service. Hulu's existing PlayStation app will be updated to give access to live TV features. In other news, Amazon Studios joined Twitter and Facebook in canceling plans to attend South by Southwest Conference in Austin, Texas. Starting March 13th, Amazon had planned two screenings, some panels, and a marketing event. I cannot tell you how itchy my face is right now. Microsoft is offering free six-month trials to the premium version of Microsoft Teams. The premium version has more calling and meeting features than the free version. Uh, but Microsoft is also updating the free version of Teams to let users schedule meetings for video calling starting March 10th. This is all to help people who have to work remotely uh, because of COVID-19 concerns. Tesla has been using an older, slower processor for its autopilot functions for cars made in China since January 7th because of a lack of chip supply. Yes, the ripples are felt by many. Tesla says it will upgrade the chip free of charge when supplies become available. The newer chips prices images 21 times faster than the previous generation. All right, let's talk a little bit more about this trend that Twitter is on. Well, Twitter is feeling quite on fleet today. They announced they will test a new <laughs> sharing format called Fleets. This is starting in Brazil. So we're going to see that happen first. Fleets cannot receive likes, public replies, or retweets and disappear after 24 hours. If it sounds a lot like a story, well, you wouldn't be crazy. Fleets show up in a rounded profile icon at the top of the timeline from people who follow each other. Fleets do not show up in search or moments and cannot be embedded on external websites. First of all, Fleets is just a great word. I mean, it's because fleeting. it's because it's a fleeting tweet. Get it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It also <laughs> so I, I, I was I was thrilled tweets. when I saw this this morning. Yeah, yeah, that too. That too. This is interesting because Twitter, the one thing about Twitter that does has never worked for me is if I am involved in watching some live event and there's, I don't know, like maybe 10 other people who are going to understand what I'm talking about or whoever happens to be on Twitter right that moment. And we're all doing the same thing. You know, like maybe if I'm watching the Super Bowl and my team is about to lose and I write like, no, and there's no context or anything. Well, I always, without fail, a few days later, we'll get someone being like, are you okay? Like, <laughs> and, and I, sometimes you're like, oh, I mean, look at the timestamp, like whatever it was is over now. But this would be really good for moments like that. The one thing about it is, is Twitter seems to be making it pretty limiting so that there's no conversation to be had. Whatever I'm saying is not only ephemeral, but kind of thrown out into the ether without any context. You can respond it, by DM. That's it. But then sure. that, that gets shuttled over into DMs. That's not a conversation that's part of the general fleet uh ecosystem the fleeco system it, it all it also assumes that you have your dms on which i assume they're going to have some sort of reminder to tell people if they get replies they're not going to be able well, to get but these the, are people who follow each other oh so you tend to have DM technically privileges. that's true yeah you can lock them out but technically that's true um the one thing we haven't said at all is that the term will be twitter fleets which is a weird thing to say out loud um <laughs> i don't know if i'm going to call them that twitter fleets like what are you doing oh well go check out my twitter fleets because if you just say go check out my fleets it's going to take a while until anybody knows what the crap you're talking about. The, and this is the first new way of communicating on Twitter since the DM, right? Yeah. They, they've, yeah. they've taken tweets and made different things out of them, like moments and trending topics and stuff. But and those yeah. are still just tweets. These are pieces of communication that will not show up in your timeline. They're accessed in a different way. They don't show up in any timeline. You have to go up and click on a thing to say, I want to see that fleet from Scott or Sarah, uh, which is a whole different way of experiencing Twitter. People are used to the sort of the river of Twitter things just kind of hitting their timeline. So uh, this this is an interesting idea, but I'm not sure if it actually solves the problem for Twitter because I think people just end up not using it. But I guess that's why they're testing it in Brazil just to find out. 
Well, if you only have, let's say I follow 200 people, they have to follow me back for me to see theirs and for them to see mine. You suddenly have just whittled the whole thing down to an audience of 200. I don't it, know if that's, well, that's and it's, interesting. The idea is this is your friends. This is like, yeah, I just want to tell my friends, the people I actually follow. But then that's also not how Twitter works because so many people game the system by automatically following back anybody who follows them, right? Right, right. So all that stuff gets real messy. Plus the whole idea of stories on other apps has always been, this is another way to reach the people following me. And there's no caveat that I have to follow them back. I think this might be a goof because if somebody, let's just, I don't know, Patton Oswalt wants to do something funny on a fleet. That would probably be cool for all of us fans of his that follow him to see it. Instead, he's got to follow us for it to matter. And I don't know that it ever will. So why would him and a bunch of his comedian friends well, just talk to each other? Just like uh, if you're a regular user, I think you get two minutes of video on a fleet. Uh, but especially approved people can get 10 minutes. I bet some people's fleets will be able to be broadly available without having to have follow backs. Yeah, I, uh, I, right. I think it, it, it'll probably become a setting that the user can choose. I also feel like, okay... This isn't exactly the same thing as a DM, but let's say the scenario that you described, Scott. What if I really did want to reach those 200 people? Not everybody following me, but you know, people that I consider a little bit closer to. Well, I don't want to DM them all separately. I don't want to put them all on a big old group DM. So this is a way to sort of half blast out something. That yeah, yeah, that's a good way. Does to it really that. need to be there the next day? They still, would, they still need to hurry up and do it in 24 hours. But yeah, it's a that's an interesting way of looking. I at. would do it for let's say announcing our live stream. But I won't because it's only going to go in the fleet section. Right. So there you go. Yep. General Motors announced a new battery called Ultium that uses pouch style cells instead of cylindrical cells. Uh, and that means they can be stacked vertically or horizontally. So you get a little more versatility in how you design the car around this electric vehicle battery. The Ultium's 50 to 200 kilowatt hour range can get up to 400 miles on a charge, depending on how it's configured. GM added aluminum to reduce the cobalt content to seven by 70%. Uh, that helps bring down the cost. Ultium's cost should be below $100 per kilowatt hour. So vehicles that use Ultium potentially would be more affordable. GM plans to have 20 electric nameplates. They're not models anymore. They're nameplates because whatever. Uh, but they're going to have 20 of those by 2023 with the first three coming in the next few months. Its plant, GM's plant in Hamtramck, Michigan, will be retrofitted to produce autonomous and electric vehicles, and battery cells will be made at a factory run by a joint venture of General Motors and LG Chem in Lordstown, Ohio. So the batteries uh, made in Lordstown, shipped up to Hamtramck, put in the vehicle, and then they roll off the assembly line. Uh, silly name aside, I think Ultium sounds like... There's I'm nothing thinking. wrong with Hamtramck. Oh, you meant Ultium. <laughs> no, Hamtramck, you guys are awesome. Don't don't go changing. But uh, I always wondered. I always wondered if big battery and or a big battery advancement would finally come from what we're doing with automobiles with with batteries. And I'm not saying that this immediately translates to batteries in general or storage in general. Yeah, it may not. Right. Yeah, but I like. I'd like to hear when there's battery innovation because you hear this all the time. Batteries haven't budged for 20 years. They haven't moved. We've just gotten smarter devices that know how to take advantage of them. Well, maybe in cars because we have a very mission critical, uh, you know, mission happening here. We can finally see some real innovation. So great. Yeah. And cobalt mining is problematic uh, price aside. So all of this sounds great. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see this in more cars if it ends up uh, being the way of the future. Well, you're going to get 20 nameplates by 2023. And, uh, yeah, and GM will probably sell these batteries to other automakers. Uh, <laughs> they, they're already in partnership with Honda on one of their EVs, so I'm sure it'll go in there. <laughs> a feature Google showed at, I'm still laughing at nameplate. A feature Google showed at CES back in January that reads web pages aloud is rolling out worldwide to Android users. Users tell Google Assistant to read it or read this page, and then the page will be read aloud and highlight words as they are read if you want to follow along. You can tap the screen to move to a particular section if you like. You can also adjust the speed of the reading to be slower or faster, kind of how you do with a podcast. Uh, if you like it to draw, draw out a little bit more or be a little bit snappier, the feature also translates between 42 languages. So this is uh, this is pretty cool, pretty nifty for 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 a lot of folks. I I don't know when I looked at the 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 way that it it worked in a in a video that Google had had shared with the world. I was like, mm, it's still kind of robotic, but 
Google Assistant's voice is one of the least annoying of all assistants to me. It's it's not that bad, and you could probably get used to it. And I love the idea of maybe for the show. I mean, I don't have an Android device, so I can't use it yet. But for the show, if I can't sit in front of my computer, but I really need to read the story about GM's new batteries, I could have it read to me. So that I see it coming in handy, even if it's not an accessibility feature, which, of course, there's that too. Yeah, I... Uh... I, I was thinking about this, and the more I think about it, the features that matter to me the most here are the speed settings, as weird as that sounds. There's a lot of things that will read stuff to me now, either manually or other apps or otherwise. So none of that none of that sounds hugely innovative. The innovation here will be kind of devil in the detail stuff, like adjusting that speed. I know people who would love to have this speed reading to them in a car, and I know others who would much rather have that slow way down um, and sort of everything in between, forgetting about you know great accessibility uh, leaps forward with this. So I'm into it and I do like that voice. I also hope there's other voice options. That'd be cool just to shake things up. Um, well, yeah, I mean, this is just a feature of Google assistant. We can have all kinds of wishes about what Google assistant could become and, and sure. that'll be, uh, be part of it. But yeah, I, I think it's a nifty, nifty thing. All right. Well, let's take a look at the folded puzzle game. Talked about this on TMS briefly this morning. Uh, this crowdsources research into protein folding in a game format and has added the COVID-19 virus or coronavirus as it's most mostly known as. Uh, and it's a related puzzle to that. The hope is to develop a protein that binds to COVID-19 to block interaction with human cells and halt infection. Human players are often better than computers at finding certain solutions, good at recognizing patterns, that sort of thing. However, the Folding at Home project is also researching the virus, Folding at Home uses spare computer cycles to power a computer model. People have certainly heard of that before, but uh, I went and downloaded this today. I haven't played it yet, but there is a Mac, a PC, and a Linux version people can download and try. Yeah, so th the idea is there's a spike on the COVID-19 virus that it uh, uses to bond to human cells, and that's how it's able to inject its uh, genetic code and replicate and that's how viruses infect you, right? They just keep replicating and replicating and replicating. So if they can create a protein that would sort of lock on to that spike and stop it from being able to connect to anything, that would stop the virus from replicating. And that would be a, a very effective treatment. Uh, this is an attempt to figure out what protein might be worth trying to block that. Uh, and, and if you're like, well, why can't you just look at it and figure out how to fold it around it? It's not that simple when you're talking about uh, how proteins fold. Hence, the projects, both uh, the folded puzzle game and folding at home, are more than 10 years old. Uh, they've been trying to find different kinds of proteins for lots of different diseases uh, through this. Folding at home uses a brute force method of just saying, let's use the extra cycles on your computer to power an algorithm that'll just try every possible combination it can, it can do. Uh, and then fold it is saying, yeah, but sometimes humans are intuitive and they can just make logical jumps that computers can't. And so that might get us to something faster. But if we pitch it as a puzzle game, then people are more likely to want to take part and try this out. So uh, either one of these or both is a great way to help contribute to a potential cure to the coronavirus. Well, I think we should all, uh, as well as not touching our faces, be playing these games. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Get get to the ah. puzzle, everybody. Let's find a solution. Humans I unite. Right when you said it. Right when you said that, I went like this, like an idiot. I don't know why I didn't notice, <laughs> and now I'm doing it again. I'm, I'm putting. Yes, it's it's that. Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to. Uh, it's the reverse psychology. I don't know of some kind, but wash yeah, your hands. Is, don't touch your face. Play fold it. Fold it. There you go. Nailed yeah. It. Yeah. I, I, it's all kidding aside. It's it's pretty amazing that the humans and mass could 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 actually be the solution that we're looking for it just takes more and more of yeah. human interaction for it to be stronger that's super and, cool and it's, it's not guaranteed right uh right. but but it's worth trying and you'll have a fun puzzle game if nothing else india's supreme court has sided with cryptocurrency exchanges that were banned in april 2018 by india's central bank uh, that barred banks from offering services that supported digital currency. So they didn't outlaw the digital currencies. They said that they can regulate banks, and therefore they're going to tell banks they can't support digital currencies, which basically undermine digital currencies in India. The court struck down the RBI's curbs, which would let virtual currency investors and businesses in India push against stricter rules being planned by the government and participate in projects 
Uh, maybe if Libra ever happens, uh, something like that. Uh, the Supreme Court is separately hearing another case which will decide on regulations for digital currencies itself. The Indian Central Bank has been exploring creating a sovereign bank digital currency of its own and said private coins like Bitcoin increase the potential for money laundering and other illegal activities. Basically, the court said that Yes, the central bank can regulate banks, but it can't stop them from doing this, that it needed to have a better reason for stopping banks from supporting digital currencies than just the fact that they're digital currencies. <clears throat> so it's not impossible that the RBI comes up with a better reason and is able to put this back in place and, and get it tested by the court. But for now, it means that cryptocurrency exchanges uh, have got a second wind. Uh I don't think India is going to give up on this, though, because anti-laundering, anti-fraud is a huge priority and a huge effort of the Modi government. Uh, so I would expect them to try another way to at least curb this, if not bring it down, uh, besides just the regulations that are also being disputed in court as well. Well, I get being super nervous about, not super nervous, that's a bad way to describe how government feels about banking regulation, but I understand the, the worries that they might have about corruption or this not working right or whatever. Um, but this does seem like a step in the right direction. If you think that cryptocurrency is a part of our banking future and you want worldwide banks to be able to, to play in that playground. Um, and considering the size of India and it's, yeah, like it's a big deal. Right. So I, I mean, the, I, it's hard to say whether this is truly a step forward or just a temporary uh, stop gap until it's set yeah. back again. I, I don't know, but I, I hope, I don't know. It feels like the future. Like, even though I barely understand it and Tom explains it every 10 days and then I try to understand it better and all that, I still, something in me knows that blockchain and, and cryptocurrency and everything around all this stuff is the future. So get on board, India. <laughs> yeah. Hey, folks. Uh, well, I, I mean, I think what this does is, is it takes an overcorrection and brings it back toward the center and... We'll see if it swings the other way or keeps, ba you know, banging around in the middle. To get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Chantel Pratt, an associate professor of psychology at the University of Washington, is the lead author on a study published in Nature's Scientific Reports looking at what is a quality that helps people to learn programming languages fast. Uh, they looked at three dozen, 36 adults uh, who, as part of this study, agreed to learn Python. During the learning process, while they were learning to program with Python, they were tested for things like problem solving, memory, language skills, numerical skills, resting state brain activity, et cetera, et cetera, to kind of assess what are these people's natural talents and how do those correlate to how well they're doing at learning the programming, because some as with everything, some people learn faster than others. The study found, and again, this is 36 adults right now, so this is a pilot study. There, there needs to be like wider studies done on this, but you do this kind of study to find out if it's worth doing those bigger studies. And this one found that the participants who learned Python the fastest had strong language, working memory, and reasoning abilities. They didn't have strong math skills. In fact, having a stronger math skill barely correlated. So it was your language skills, your memory, working memory particularly, and your ability to reason that correlated with being able to learn the programming language fast. Math, engineering types of skills that aren't related to reasoning were not important in how well you were able to program Python. Uh, so they're concluding that it seems like learning a programming language may be more like learning an actual spoken language, like Korean or Spanish, than it is like learning math. And that the idea that we're putting development and coding and programming in the math sciences department may be doing a lot of people who would be great programmers a disservice because, well, I'm crappy at calculus, I guess I'll never be a coder, doesn't appear to be true. And mm. so many of computer science degrees are set up with a very strong math um, foundation. I mean, I was a math major briefly. <laughs> I like math. I, I've I've always found math fun. But it was something where I was under the I was under the understanding that I would have to go really far in math if I wanted to, you know, get into a C a, a CS type of field 
And I just ended up going in a different direction. But I know so many other people who are like, oh, I would just be completely, uh, you know, priced out of uh, something like this because I'm not so good with numbers. And it turns out that the more programming languages have evolved over the years, the more they are language based rather than just being able to, you know, think of everything in terms of numbers, which is a good thing. Doesn't mean you don't still need math skills, but I love the idea that it's a lot like learning a foreign language because that's what it is. Mm. It's it's a foreign language that you yeah, you you won't necessarily just be good at it if you're bilingual already. But it's right. something where it's like, I want to figure out how to convey this thought. How do I do it? And that makes a lot of sense to me. Today's today even more so, it's more of a language and less of a math language. Um, the languages are object oriented. They don't have the same kind of re reliance on one's math skills that they may have used to uh, had. And so I can speak from my own experience. There was a time where I was heavily involved in making PHP web pages. What interested me was not the math. It's never been my strong suit. Always hated math. And when I had to use it, I would. But what really stuck with me and what really made it a great fun endeavor for me was the communication side of it of if I do this, then this happens. If somebody enters this, then look at all the cool things that can happen as a result when they hit that submit key. Like to me, that was magic. I felt like I was like working in a, I don't know, like a whole new medium that was different than math. That was different than even just communication. It was a way to like bring data from one place to another because someone made, uh, you know, did something. And what I'm saying is probably very rudimentary to most programmers and where what got them into it when they were 10 or 11 years old. But even as an adult, that really appealed to me. And I think that this this has actually helped kind of confirm for me what I was what I was jiving on was this feeling of, well, this isn't just math. This isn't just algebra. This is, it's some of those things and I need to bu buff up on those things and that's great and it never hurts. But really what is, this is about execution. It's about planning. It's about result. What result do I want? And therefore what underpinnings need to exist for the result to happen? That's very different than just, you know, knowing the end of an equation. Yeah, a, a lot of people have been saying logic uh, in the Twitch chat while we're doing this show. And it's not exactly logic depending on what you mean by it. Logic is sort of a loosely used term, but logic in the mathematical sense doesn't seem to be what they're talking about. If by logic, you don't really mean logic, but you mean reasoning, then yeah, just being able to problem solve and sort of intuitively understand like, well, if this is true and this is true, then this is probably also true. That seems to be part of this. I'll tell you, man, uh, when I was in college, I was a very mixed up person, uh, but you know, I did great at linear algebra. Uh, I hated business calculus. Later, I found out that's because I took business calculus and not just <laughs> calculus. Uh, and I was I was all turned around, but I thought, well, if I want to do computer science, I have to do those classes, uh, and I don't want to keep doing those classes. And I loved journalism, and I loved language. So I look at this like a lot of other people in, in our chat and, and, and y'all uh, and say, well, shoot, if if the standards had been, you need to be good at reasoning, working memory, and ling and language, I probably be, would have like dived right in and done whatever math. Mm -hmm. you I don't think we're saying you don't need any math. We're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater here. Uh, but I would have done the math that I needed to do to understand the programming languages without worrying like, oh, I have to be really, really good at it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I think that's totally, I, I think I would have done more of that in college. And I would have been less like, no, I'm an artist type. I can't do that. And they shouldn't come over here either. Stay in your lane, guys. Like, I would have looked at it very differently. It was a, it was a weird assumption back then. And there's time. also, you know, there's the obvious gender gap uh, mm -hmm. with coders and engineers. And it doesn't mean, oh, well, that's because men are better at math than women. And that's why they're all coders now. But I think that they're there was sort of this uh, assumption that, well, it's so male dominated because that's just sort of the way that it's set up. It's a little bit more intimidating. And this kind of study makes me hope that it would be less intimidating because it opens up a lot more skill sets of people who are like, oh yeah, that sounds exactly like me. This sounds fun. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Stoic Squirrel pointed out, uh, you don't really need a degree to become a coder anymore. So th there is, you know, an, an escape true. valve here where if you're, if you've been thinking, gosh, programming sounds fun, but it's probably got a lot of math. You just go get a Udemy course or, or something like that and, and start programming. Uh, there's, there's no reason to wait around, uh, which is one of the beauties of sort of the advancement in technology and the internet, uh, has made available, but, but you should, even then, even if you're not going to go the college route, you should know like, oh, it's the, it's these kinds of skills that might make programming 
easier for you to learn than you thought. Again, this is only 36 adults. There needs to be a wider study, um, but it does kind of make some sense. Mm -hmm. I wish I was part of the study. It sounds like just a cool study. Maybe you could be, be part like, of the next study. Explore my mind. Tell me if I'm good at coding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You could submit stories and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. You can also join the conversation in our Discord, which you can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. All right, let's check in. What's the latest on text message this week where Nate Langson is tackling food and royalty? Hey, let me ask you all a question. Would you eat food you ordered from someone on Facebook Marketplace? Even if you didn't know them, it's been happening a lot in the UK, and our equivalent of the US FDA is getting involved. Also, in England, we have a lot of prehistoric buildings and castles and relics of villages built hundreds of years ago, and metal detectors have got so affordable and good that archaeologists are worried that people who buy them don't realise that if they find treasure, it belongs to the Queen. But you can learn more about Facebook food and what the Queen doesn't want you digging up on text message at uktechshow.com. They talked about an ad on Facebook for a single onion two kilometers away from Nate. <laughs> wow. Like, wow. Who would do that? I seems... guess if you live next door, right? Not everybody's two kilometers away. If you live next door and you needed an onion real bad, but you'd go to Facebook to find that? I don't know. I don't know if that's the way. It... The world works. Mm. But yes, any treasure you find belongs to the queen as it should. <laughs> All right, let's check out the mailbag Nick writes in about our conversation about uh, Apple maybe going mini LED. Nick says, I'm actually excited to see reports that Apple is going to go down the mini LED route with their coming products, according to Ming-Chi Kuo. I have zero Apple hardware in my life, but I have a super high-end PC. The highest-end gaming PC monitors are getting new revisions later this year with mini LED backlights, and the new backlight is expected to add a large amount to the price of these new revisions. With Apple ordering mini LED backlights from suppliers first, that will hopefully mean the orders would be high enough to bring down mini LED prices in general. Right now, there's a premium charged for mini LED, and anything that brings down the price is nothing but good news to me, as these displays are amazing to gaze upon. That's a cool way of looking at this, Nick, which is like, you know, I don't, I'm not going to buy an Apple product, but man, if they, if they start making the price of mini LEDs uh, uh, <laughs> scale high enough that, that it brings down prices for other people, that that could be cool. I love yeah, that. Yeah, we should all get stoked when we hear uh, Samsung's going to do a thing. And they're gonna yeah, yeah. Worldwide, because then it makes Apple fans, they should go, oh, well, that means that stuff's going to come down. Maybe we'll see something similar or it'll be cheaper when it hits. Same thing goes the other way. Like this is this is the reason why this particular part of techn uh, technology competition is good. And I say, you know, hooray for that. I'm all ready for mi uh, mini pixel. Let's go. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Steve Ayadarola, Mark Gibson and Dr. Carmine M. Bailey. Scott Johnson, I hope you haven't been touching your face. Uh, just the but, once but even if you have what else has been going on over the last week well and i'm not when i'm not trying to not touch my face i'm busy making content and you can find all of it over at frogpants.com if comics are your liking there's a bunch of links there if you'd rather listen to a bunch of podcasts that have been around forever you can listen to those lots of projects lots of cool stuff always available at your fingertips at frogpants.com and for everything else you can poke me on twitter and maybe you'll see my fleets when they happen over at Twitter.com slash Scott Johnson. I can't wait to make my first fleet. Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll travel to Brazil just so I can do it. Hey, uh, you know what day it is? What? It's three months since we started the counter on people getting a sticker, poster, mug, or T-shirt with the special six-year anniversary DTNS logo on it. Oh. oh I just got the email from Patreon uh, that the first batch is headed to the factory to get printed and mailed out to 174 patrons who are at the right level, kept their pledge for three months, and will be getting their stuff. You can join them, folks. Get some cool stuff and insider perks on top of it. All the details are at patreon.com slash DTNS slash merch. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You got something to say, something on your mind? We'd love to hear it. We're live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>